Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my uh, defense. The title of my thesis is Contextuality Beyond the Quotient Specker Theorem. Uh, don't worry if you don't know what these words mean. I'm going to explain them. The outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to give a brief background as to where this work fits in. Then I'll give you some concepts and definitions which we are going to need in this talk, which are not very standard in uh, physics outside of quantum foundations. Then I'll give you a brief description of what the quotient specker theorem is and what we think are issues with its experimental testability. And then we'll go beyond the quotient specker theorem, which is we will, uh, which is where I will talk about my research uh, with my collaborators, a lot of it. And then I'll, at the end, I'll summarize with the key results from the thesis. OK, so the motivation. The motivation for this research is uh, essentially twofold. Uh, the first motivation is foundational, which is to understand uh, the ways in which it may be possible or not, mostly not, to accommodate quantum theory in a deeper picture of reality. What we mean by reality, uh, it will become clear as we go on. Uh, so, so there are these two theorems in quantum foundations called Bell's theorem and the quotient specker theorem. And uh, mostly we are going to talk about the quotient specker theorem. The second motivation is more about applications, which is where, uh, particularly in quantum information, where you want to be precise and quantitative about those features of quantum theory that power uh, quantum over classical advantages in, in quantum information and, and quantum computation. Uh, mostly my motivation is foundational. Applications like will come once these results are on a sound, are on a sound footing. So our focus is the quotient specker theorem. Bell and quotient specker are two major no-go theorems in quantum foundations. Bell's theorem is known to have wide-ranging implications for quantum information processing. This review, this review of modern physics article, gives you a nice sort of uh, uh, overview of the development of this field over the last 20 years or so, 20, 25, I don't know. We are going to talk about the quotient specker theorem. It's, it's a theorem that's merely of, of theoretical interest because, because it makes certain idealizations that make it difficult to test experimentally. There's a lot of controversy in the late 90s and like early 2000s or so. There was a lot of controversy over it, whether it makes sense to talk about a meaningful test of the quotient specker theorem. Uh, there's strong recent evidence that contextuality actually d d drives uh, quantum over classical advantages in information processing and computation. So, so these are some recent papers uh, that, go all, uh, th that show some results like that. So, so this is just by way of motivation why, why we care about the quotient specker theorem. Oh, sorry. So where it all started, the most of the questions that are sort of considered in this research are uh, which have been posed are mostly motivated by this paper, which defined a lot of the concepts that we are going to talk about. So this paper uh, essentially revised a lot of standard definitions uh, 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 regarding the quotient specker theorem, and then it recovered quotient specker theorem in a certain limit. Okay, so the first notion we are going to need is uh, this this notion of what an operational theory is and what its ontological model means. So by an operational theory, we mean a theory in which the primitives of the theory, the, the primitive objects in the theory, are operations. They are things you can do in a laboratory. So these are operations like preparation procedures. This green box here is like just some box where you press a button, it releases a system prepared according to this description. And this red box here is a measurement procedure where once a system enters, you uh, choose your measurement and it gives you a certain outcome. And all that the operational theory cal uh, cares about is wh what is the prediction for uh, a certain outcome given that measurement procedure M was used, and that was preceded by uh, preparation procedure P. So it's just a recipe to calculate probabilities of measurement outcomes. Okay. So by an operational theory, we mean a theory which is uh, where the primitives are the operations, and that's all you care about. You care about predictions. Okay. Uh, an ontological model is supposed to be an, uh, a, uh, an attempt to sort of explain uh, what you see in your operational theory in terms of uh, states of a physical system, where you're trying to say that, that, um, that this, this lambda, the, the, primitive, the primitive 
object in an ontological model is this thing called a lambda, which is supposed to represent all uh, relevant physical properties of a system. Okay? In, in traditional discussions of quantum foundations, it's often called a hidden variable. But it doesn't always have to be hidden. And therefore, we are going to call it uh, an ontic state. Uh, that's the term that's used in the literature. But I'm just going to call it a physical state of the system. Okay? And uh, so, so the way this, this, this description is supposed to account for this description, what you see in the lab, is via this. So every preparation procedure, we imagine samples from a set of physical states lambda according to some probability distribution, mu lambda given p. Okay? This is, so every time you implement this procedure, this explanation says that what you're doing is you're preparing a system in, in state lambda with, probability, uh, with this probability, mu. And every time you make a measurement, this model says that uh, the measurement has certain response functions associated with it. The measurement responds to these physical states lambda according to this distribution. So this is the probability that outcome k for measurement m occurs when the physical state is lambda. And the way the operational predictions arise is because of ignorance, which is that you don't know exactly which lambda is realized in a particular run of the experiment. So you have this distribution. And you have to average this response that you see to, uh, uh, to the measurement over all lambdas. So, so you average the response function for a given physical state with respect to the distribution over physical states. And you want this description to recover this description. So this was a bit abstract. Uh, more concretely, when you think of quantum theory as an operational theory, what we mean by a preparation procedure P, the mathematical representation of a preparation procedure is an operator rho P, a density operator, which is positive and trace one. Every measurement procedure is associated with a positive operator valued measure, where uh, for every event k given m, there's a, uh, there's a P of m element. And the way these two descriptions in the operational theory are combined to give probabilities, the predictions, is via the Born rule, which is you take the trace of the, the, the positive operator for the measurement outcome you're interested in with respect to the preparation, uh, the density operator that the preparation prepares. So that's all. That's, that's what the operational theory is. You don't, you don't, you don't care about, um, all you care about is what preparation procedure you implemented, what measurement procedure you implemented, and what are the predictions. Okay? So these are just formal definitions of what I've just said. Uh, one thing to uh, note here is that we're going to call this particular assumption, uh, we're calling this the assumption of outcome determinism, which is that if you assume that for any measurement event in your op operational theory, for any measurement event, the, the physical state lambda specifies whether or not that event occurs deterministically. It says that the response function is deterministic. It takes value 0 or 1. Then we call that the assumption of outcome determinism. This is just saying that at some fine-grained level, uh, these, uh, the outcomes of measurements are determined. So the, the point is that we do not want to assume this in our discussion. A uh, the question specker theorem assumes this, and we want to relax this assumption and still derive some sort of uh, 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 no-go theorem. So this I've already said the ontological model should be empirically adequate, which is that it should reproduce the operational predictions. This is how they fit together. So now that we have a definition of what an operational theory is, we can define equivalence relations in an operational theory. So if you consider the set of preparation procedures in the operational theory, we call two preparation procedures, P and P prime, operationally equivalent. So this is an equivalence relation over the set of preparation procedures. If no measurement event K for uh, outcome K for measurement M yields different outcome probabilities for them. That is, there exists no measurement device, no procedure that you can do in a lab that can distinguish uh, this preparation procedure from this preparation procedure. For all measurements, these two preparation procedures give you the same uh, probabilities. Okay, so operationally, there's no way to distinguish between them. That's why we call them operationally equivalent. Similarly, for measurement effects, for events, uh, we call two events operationally equivalent, uh, denoted like this, if no preparation procedure yields different outcome probabilities for them. So uh, for all preparation procedures, you get exactly the same statistics for the two events. So there's no operational way to tell them apart. Okay, so this is an equivalence relation. So what does this equivalence relation do? Over the space of preparation procedures in the operational theory, it partitions the, the, operation, uh, the, the preparation procedures into equivalence classes, right? So each red uh, blob here is, contains preparations which 
are operationally equivalent. Okay, so P and P prime are operationally equivalent, and they're and P1, P2, and P3 are operationally equivalent. So all of these are like operationally equivalent to each other. They give you the same predictions, and you know the the, the operational theory doesn't care about whatever differences you might see between them. So this is a difference. So any distinctions that you see between them, between otherwise operationally equivalent uh, procedures, is a difference of context. That's what we mean by the word context in contextuality. Okay, it's a distinction between operationally equivalent procedures. The same thing is true of measurements. Uh, you can, uh, the equivalence relation between measurements defines equivalence classes of measurements. So in a given equivalence class, you have a set of measurement procedures. And uh, there may be dis differences between them, but they don't matter to the eventual predictions. And this is a difference of context. Okay. So I just defined this. What's a context? It's any distinction between two operationally equivalent uh, experimental procedures. This any distinction between things in a blob here, things in a blob here, okay? Examples. So to be concrete, in quantum theory, uh, if you take a density operator, that corresponds to an equivalence class of preparations, preparation procedures. So a simple example, if, if you take the maximally mixed state of a qubit, there's many ways you can prepare it. Two, two ways of doing that is that you take a uh, spin up along uh, z direction, spin down along z direction, and mix them with the equal probability. You prepare this mixed state. You can do a different procedure, which is you prepare spin uh, x up and x down with equal probability. That also gives you the same uh, density operator. So these are two different um, preparation procedures for the same uh, preparation. Okay, so, so these are preparation contexts. Similarly, you can also talk about uh, purifications. If, if, you, if, you, if, you, uh, if, if, if you sort of trace over some ancillary b over this pure state psi a b, uh, then you get density operator rho a. Similarly, if it's some different ancilla, you could recover the same density operator on the reduced system. Okay, so these are this is a difference of context. It doesn't the predictions of rho a are independent of where rho a came from, right? Measurement context. What do we mean by a measurement context in quantum theory? So a simple example is that if you think of Hermitian operators a, b, and c, which represent projective measurements, then imagine when a and b commute, a and c commute, but b and c don't commute. Then, then you know that there's no way to measure A, B, and C all three together. Uh, but you can measure A with B and A with C. So B and C are distinct joint measurement contexts for the measurement of A. right? The operational predictions about A are not actually going to depend on whether you did it with B or C or whether you did it alone. Similarly, there's, there's another notion of, so this is, this is the sort of measurement context that is used in the quotient specker theorem. This is uh, another notion of a measurement context, which which, which, which we use in this, in this paper, where uh, different operationally equivalent ways of implementing a fair coin flip measurement. So this is a POVM. It's a trivial POVM. You just flip a coin, and that's, that's, that's what this says, that this outcome occurs with probability half, this outcome occurs with the probability half, regardless of what input is given to the uh, measurement device. So there's another way of realizing. So one way of realizing this is you're given a quantum system, you throw it away, you just flip a fair coin and assign outcomes to the system. Okay. Another way of implementing it is that you choose one of three possible projective measurements randomly, and then you coarse grain over the outcomes of those three to define a coarse grain POVM, and that turns out to be operationally equivalent to a fair coin flip. So this is a very involved way of like convoluted way of doing a fair coin flip measurement. But here you're actually doing something to the system. So these are two, you're doing two different things, but you get the same statistics for these, these things. So these, these are the projectors which give you this. This will come later. So I'll come back to this at some point. OK, so, so we have three, uh, so, so far we have three notions in hand. One is what's an operational theory and its ontological model. We know what operational equivalence is. We define equivalence relations for between preparation and measurement, uh, preparation procedures and between measurement procedures. And we know what a context means. It's any, dif uh, any distinction between operationally equivalent things. So now we are in a position to define what we mean by the word non-contextuality. So non-contextuality is essentially the identity of indiscernibles. It's saying that if two things are indiscernible, if there's no operational way to distinguish two things, if there's no experiment that you can do which can tell them apart, then they must be physically identical. Then they are really the same thing. Okay? The, so this is just a qualitative statement. The way this is reflected in our uh, work is measurement non-contextuality is this assumption that if you don't see a difference between these two events operationally, if no experiment can tell them apart, then it's a plausible hypothesis that the response functions for these two guys are the same. 
which is that the reason you don't see a difference is that there's no difference in the way that the measurement procedures respond to the uh, to every physical state lambda and therefore you get this so note that the converse implication like the this side implies this side because that's that's trivially true because no matter what distribution you average this with you average this with the same distribution you get the same statistics here right so that's trivially true so that's a natural explanation for why this should be true but this is not obvious this is not mathematically the case this is a hypothesis so we are making this assumption that operational equivalence um, implies equivalence at the level of lambdas okay similarly for preparations uh, what we are saying here is that if two preparations are impossible to preparation procedures are impossible to distinguish operationally then it must be because they are actually sampling exactly in the same manner from the space of physical states okay again the converse is true it's this direction that's a hypothesis and we want to test this hypothesis okay by the way an equivalent way of stating what i've just said here is that if two things were non identical if they were physically distinct then we are assuming that there must exist some operational way of seeing that difference okay like that's the sort of assumption we are making okay this is just just saying that why preparation contextuality is uh, is sort of a weird fine tuned thing that if you have so so if 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 the the consequent in that implication fails if if mu if this these distributions are different for some set of lambda some physical states lambda but yet no no measurement on these two preparations p and p prime can reveal this difference so what does this mean this means that these two are unequal on some set of lambda yet when i take the average over all lambdas uh the answers are the same so basically the these response functions have to be fine tuned in a way to sort of uh um, you know uh, obliterate any distinctions uh, in the operational theory similarly in measurement contextuality if these two response functions are actually different for some set of lambda but no preparation can reveal this difference this means that every pre pre preparation procedure has to adjust its distribution the 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 way it's sampling from the set of physical states such that this operational equivalence is preserved and note that uh, a preparation procedure precedes the measurement so this is kind of weird that you know a preparation procedure has to care about what measurement some experimenter might do later on okay okay so uh, this is just to note that you know the the reason we are talking about the ontological models framework is that it forces us to be explicit about our assumptions uh by separating what what are the strictly operational aspects of quantum theory things that are just about predictions of quantum theory from speculations that one might make about what these predictions mean for uh, uh, elements of physical reality okay uh, an ex example of this is just like if you take standard quantum theory a lot of people have this at the back of their mind which is that you know the space of pure states is the set of physical states okay that's when i prepare a system i prepare it in a pure state okay and you think of a preparation procedure uh, so in the i'm just stating it in this framework the same thing okay so i think of lambda as the, the just the projective hilbert space a preparation procedure for a pure state psi prime is uh, this density op op rank one density operator is just this dirac delta distribution over the set of pure states so this just picks out the pure state you want to prepare and um, if when you preparing a mixed state an ensemble uh, for example a set of uh, pure states psi prime each with probability p psi prime this is represented by just the convex mixture of these dirac deltas right and uh, now a measurement uh, of a povm a povm on the other hand is represented with response functions so this is the outcome given the physical state is defined by just the born rule so for every physical state which we take to be the pure state we the outcome uh, the probability of outcome associated with operator qk is just given by trace of qk this is just the expectation value of qk with respect to psi right so this model reproduces quantum theory it trivially reproduces quantum theory because in, in some sense it is quantum theory right like well i mean there is a distinction like we we are making this sort of we are we are adding this additional layer of lambdas here and then we are saying that when when you average over these lambdas uh, so so this model reproduces quantum theory for pure state it trivially does that for mixed states you just you will just average this thing with respect to the respective weights and you will get all the predictions the interesting thing to note about this model is that it's measurement non contextual which is that in the operational equivalences in the in quantum theory are preserved in this model that's simply the case because we have just taken the rule for assignment of probabilities to be the same as the quantum thing in this in this model and uh, so so the operational equivalences for these operators are preserved 
So every projection operator can appear in different bases. So those are two different contexts. But the probability that you get for a given state is the same, regardless of what basis it appears in. So that's the that's fact is preserved here. Then uh, outcome, and it's outcome indeterministic, because the bond rule is not, doesn't give you deterministic outcomes. It gives you probabilities. It only gives you deterministic outcomes for eigenstates and projective measurements. Uh, but this note that this model is preparation contextual. This, this model, uh, in this model, there are distinctions between preparation procedures that you don't see in the operational predictions. So what's the distinction? If I take two uh, uh, different decompositions of a density matrix, those are two different ensembles. This is one ensemble, and they can be a different ensemble with a side double prime or something. Okay, these are different sets of pure states mixed with some probabilities. And the claim is that the density operator is the same. But in the representation, the, when we write down this distribution, since this is a mixture of these Dirac deltas, we know that these distributions will be different for the two ensembles. So even though the, the, the distributions we associated with ensembles are different, when you average this with respect to these response functions, you don't see those distinctions in the operational theory. You just get the bond rule, the trace rule for, uh, in quantum theory. OK, so the story so far is this. This is the space of uh, operational theories. This is like preparation measurement procedures, predictions, what we care about. This is the ontological model. Primitives are the ontic states. Here, primitives are the uh, operations that you do. And what we want to do is we want to preserve certain equivalence relations. There's an equivalence relation in the operational theory. We want to preserve in, it in the ontological model. We want to sort of say that the reason these are operationally equivalent is because this is true, because they're represented the same way. Similarly, we want to preserve this equivalence relation here. Okay? And the question is, is it possible to build, like, uh, is, is it possible to test for the possibility of such uh, an ontologic, such a representation given experimental data? Okay? Can you explain it in terms of such an ontological model? So what's the quotient specker theorem? In one line, the quotient specker theorem just says that a measurement non-contextual and outcome deterministic ontological model of quantum theory is impossible. So it's a no-go statement. It says that certain ways of building ontological models are not possible for quantum theory. Okay? Uh, we call this joint assumption. So we've defined what measurement on contextuality was. Okay? Outcome deterministic, also we know what it is. When you combine these two things, we call that quotient specker non-contextuality. This is our case non-contextuality. This is just to distinguish it from our use of the word, because we use the word non-contextuality in a more general sense. Okay? Okay. So the original proof of the quotient specker theorem uh, required 117 states in three dimensions. Okay, it's a pure states like rays in three dimensions. And this was the orthogonality graph for those rays. Okay, we're not going to use this to understand the quotient specker theorem. There's a much simpler proof, uh, which is due to these people, Cabello, Estabrans, Garcia, Alcain, uh, which uses 18 rays in a four dimensional Hilbert space. So there are 18 pure states, and uh, you build your proof out of that. Okay, so, so here each node is a pure state or a projector. The, on to the pure state. Okay? So the, these are the vectors associated with this orthonormal basis. So every loop is an orthonormal basis. Okay? These four are the four possible uh, measurement outcomes if I'm measuring in this basis. Right? M jointly exhaustive and mutually exclusive. Similarly, these four, uh, and so there are, there's a bunch of 18 projectors, and they can be carved up into orthonormal bases in such a way that every projector appears in two bases, this one and this one. So every, so this uh, measurement event appears in this measurement. Uh, and there's also a measurement event in this uh, thing, which is equivalent to this one, right? Like so, so the same projector appears in two different bases. So we know that, so we see that there's an operational equivalence here, that the probability for a particular outcome pi corresponding to, let's say, this projector, given a basis, let's say, this basis, and a state rho, is the same as the probability associated with this projector, which is the, actually the same projector, but now we are con conditioning on this basis. We are saying this basis, basis prime, given rho, is the same for, for, for the two sort of uh, events. So, uh, and this is equal to trace rho pi for all rho. So this is an operational equivalence in quantum theory. right? So, so regardless of which basis pi appears in, the prediction for, the, for, for that outcome is going to be the same for all states. So that's an operational equivalence between these two measurement events, pi given basis, pi given basis prime. Okay? Now, quotient specker non contextuality says that this implies that these two things have to be the same. That's measurement non contextuality. Okay? That the response functions are the same. That's why you see this in an ontological model. And further, outcome determinism, that, that actually these things are deterministic. Like, you know, lambda specifies which outcome occurred for each measurement. So that's what you're assuming. 
So let's call the 0, 1 values that, lambda that a given lambda assigns to these outcomes. Let's label them by w1 to w18. Okay? w1 to w18 are just numbers, 0 or 1. So w1, w2, w3, w4, and so on to w18. Okay? That's, that's, that's the labeling. So if you just write down, this is just normalization. This is just saying that in every outcome exactly one, every measurement exactly one outcome occurs. There are nine measurements. Okay? So this is, I've just written, written, that, written that down as a set of nine equations. Now if you, if you sum the left-hand side and the right-hand side, then you see uh, in this figure every node appears in two uh, bases. Right? Every projector appears in two bases. Uh, therefore, every uh, variable here appears twice in, in, in these equations. So if you sum these up, you get two times the sum over w1 uh, to w18. Okay? And, since, and you know that there's no 0, 1 valued solution to this because on the right-hand side, you have 9. Right? So it's not possible to build uh, an ontological model which satisfies question spiker non-contextuality for this. So what does this mean? That, for example, an example assignment is that if I assign the value 1 here, and these are zeros, 1 here, these are zeros, 1 here, these are zeros, and whatever zeros they in induce, I assign one here, then what we are left with is a contradiction here. What value we assign to this has to depend on whether we consider it a part of this basis. If you consider it a part of this basis, then we have to assign it a value one, okay, for normalization. And if we consider it a part of this basis, then we have to assign it value zero in, in this basis. So it's a basis dependent, suddenly it becomes like a, a contextual thing, the value assignment. So that's what we mean by quotient specker contextuality. So what's, what are the obstacles to a robust experimental test of the quotient specker theorem? The first is that it's a statement about quantum theory in particular, in particular about projective measurements in quantum theory. And even if you're only interested in quantum theory, the, the point is that uh, in, uh, projective measurements are not the most general sorts of measurements. In a given experiment, there'll be noise, and you'll end up doing some positive operator-valued measures. And uh, so we need an experimental test that is sort of independent of the quantum formalism, in the sense that we want to assume as few things as possible about the operational theory. So we'll use, it should, it'll share some features with quantum theory, but it need not be the same thing as quantum theory. The reason this, this sort of, we, one tries to do, one tries to make things as independent of quantum theory as possible is to be able to, for example, a, more, a practical reason is that in, in, in protocols, experimental protocols, you want to identify precisely which ingredients are responsible for, uh, the, for, for the efficiency of a protocol. If I build a protocol using non-contextuality or contextuality, then I have to tell which, which aspects of quantum theory are relevant? Not, I don't have to mention all of quantum theory, right? So, I, and the other thing is that uh, you know you allow, you want to allow for the possibility that your experimental apparatus does not exactly obey quantum theory. It could be something else, but as long as it obeys the conditions you want, you can still your results will still hold. The second is that if the assumption of outcome determinism is relaxed, then the quotient specker contradiction disappears. So here, if I if these values were assigned to be allowed to be any probability, then you don't have this contradiction, right? Like you can always assign probabilities to these guys such that this is satisfied. So if I live, if I remove outcome determinism, I can preserve measurement non-contextuality, and I'm fine. So so we want to abandon this outcome determinism sort of assumption because because it doesn't let us test contextuality because this says that you have to give up one of the two things, either measurement non-contextuality or outcome uh, determinism. Okay. So our work is about trying to overcome these obstacles. Okay. So uh, just that 18 vector example that I used, now I, I'm just drawing a more operational picture of the same figure. Okay. There were nine measurements in that figure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay. And they shared some outcomes. Now instead of the drawing the shared outcomes, what I'm doing is I'm doubling up every outcome. So I'm saying, you know, this outcome belongs to this basis and this outcome uh, belongs to this, this measurement. Okay? And I'm saying that these two are operationally equivalent. So I'm just labeling this by outcome one of measurement M1. This is outcome four of measurement M6. So these two are operationally equivalent. In quantum theory, that's true because they are the same projector. But in general, if I'm given some operational theory, I'm just asking for 30, uh, 36, 9, 4 is a 36, 36 uh, uh, measurement events such that they satisfy such these operational equivalences between them. Okay? And uh, so this is just the operational version of that figure that you saw. And this is what contextuality means here, that every time I assign a value, 1 or 0, I have to assign the same value to the two guys. Right? So it has to be both blacks or both whites. Uh, white is 0 and uh, black is 1. So, so the contradiction we saw was here. If you consider it a part of this basis, there has to be assigned value 0. If you consider this outcome to be a part of, uh, so this is this basis, 
and you have to assign it a value zero. So this is a contextual uh, sort of assignment. Okay. So this is just an operational sort of way of stating the quotient specter theorem. I'm saying the same thing, except I'm being explicit about the operational equivalences. I'm labeling every out projector by the basis it appears in, in some sense. Okay. The additional thing we are going to use in this uh, operationalization is uh, existence of preparations. Okay, so with every measurement, we are going to associate four preparations. A measurement had four outcomes, we are going to associate four preparations with it. Okay, so with measurement M1, I'm associating four preparations, one, 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 two, one, three, and one, four. And uh, eventually, what we are interested in is the statistics of this preparation on measurement, on outcome one of measurement M1. Okay, so in quantum theory, you know that that will be one because you can, these guys can be taken to be the uh, eigenstates for each projector in, in, in a basis, okay? And, and then you know that the probability of the first outcome, first eigen, uh, eigenstate, uh, sorry, first outcome on its eigenstate is, is one, right? So anyway, that'll come later, but the thing is that with every uh, measurement, we associate four preparations such that these four preparations, when I mix them with equal probability, one fourth each, they give some average preparation. And we do this for each of the each uh, measurement, like e each, each set of four preparations. And then we have nine average preparations, each, prepar each average preparation associated with uh, a measurement, okay? And this region, yellow region, is the region of operational equivalence. We are saying that these preparations are operationally equivalent. There's no experiment, there's no measurement that can tell them apart, okay? In quantum theory, these will be essentially the maximally mixed state in four dimensions, identity over four. That's, the, that's just the trivial sort of state. But in, uh, in an operational theory, we're just assuming that they're operationally equivalent. They're not, we're not asking that they're of a certain form, okay? Okay, so once we have uh, these two things, it turns out that you can actually derive that assumption of outcome determinism if you're given preparation non-contextuality. So we are going to apply preparation non-contextuality to this operational equivalence. So remember, this is the operational equivalence, like between all these nine guys. And uh, uh, preparation on contextuality means that they sample identically from the set of physical states, right? We associate the same distribution with them. Uh, so using that fact, we can, uh, you can justify outcome determinism if you're given an experimental fact. So this is something you can check in the laboratory. You have to check that for all i and k, i runs from one to nine and k from one to four. So all of these 36 things, K, the outcome K of measurement MI occurs with probability one when the preparation is PIK, okay? That the corresponding, they're perfectly correlated. Like each preparation I chose is perfectly correlated with the measurement outcome. So we call this property perfect correlation or perfect predictability, that this is perfectly predictable on this preparation, okay? Or they're perfectly correlated. Quantum example is just like a projective measurement on an eigenstate, it's perfectly predictable. Then under the assumption of preparation non contextuality we can show this, that, that this is true. I can go through the arg argument, but I don't think I'll have enough time, so I'll skip it. But just, just assume that, uh, so, so, so you can prove that if you're given this, and if you're given this, then you can show this, okay? So, with, so once we have justified outcome determinism in this manner from preparation non contextuality we can recover the quotient specker contradiction that we had, okay? This time, instead of using outcome determinism as an assumption, we're deriving it from preparation non contextuality Okay, so I'll skip this for now. Uh, so quotient specker theorem, uh, operational, uh, so, so the way it was stated was that you had some operational equivalences between measurements. You, ha you applied measurement non-contextuality, you applied outcome determinism, you ran into a contradiction. That's what we saw in the first figure I gave you. So we have eliminated outcome determinism in the following manner. So when I say universal non-contextuality, I mean both preparation and measurement non-contextuality. And we had operational equivalences between them in those two uh, yellow figures I show showed you. And there's perfect correlation. That's, that's, that's the previous thing that I said, that you experimentally check if this thing is true, okay? Then that leads to a contradiction. How? Because uh, a preparation non contextuality and perfect correlation actually implies outcome determinism, and you can recover your contradiction from here, instead of from here. So the difference between these two statements is that here, these two statements are about the ontological model. And we, 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 don't all, we don't, in general, have access to those lambdas. Those are just presumed hypothetical entities. And these are properties of those entities. And so when you run into a contradiction, you can give, either, give up either of these assumptions and, and you know, resolve the contradiction. But here, you have to note that this property and this property are measurable things. These are all properties of the operational theory. You can do an experiment and verify these two things. 
And the hypothesis about the ontological model is purely about non-contextuality. Agreed, we've added preparation non-contextuality, but that's for well-motivated reasons, for the same reasons that we have measurement non-contextuality. Okay. So the con when you see a contradiction, it means that you have to give up uh, non-contextuality, as long as you've verified these two things. Okay. So this leads to a formulation of a non-contextuality inequality. So, so we saw that these three things lead to a contradiction. So that means that if this is true and this is true, then this thing must fail, right? To Yeah, so perfect correlation plays a role because this is about, uh, the, we're trying to recover this from this. So there's preparation non-contextuality here in this universal thing, right? Hmm. Yeah, measurement. Yes, but but that uh, that's for quantum theory. If you're assuming quantum, here we are not assuming quantum theory. So we are asking what operational fact about what operational fact allows you to derive outcome determinism, right? So when you prove it for quantum theory, you're using this fact about quantum theory, and now we're just stating that fact without assuming that the theory in which this fact is true is quantum theory. Do you see what I'm trying to say? This is relevant. This is, so I can show you this argument like later if you want, but like I should really rush. I think. Anyway, so we have. So this is how we have eliminated outcome determinism as an assumption. So now, uh, so this means that if you want to preserve non-contextuality and we have want to have operational equivalences, then perfect correlation must fail. Okay. So not only is it the fact that uh, a perfect correlation is impossible, but it should be bounded by some number. Right? So this leads to the quantity we want to bound in our inequality, which is just the average of this quantity, for which we had earlier assumed perfect correlation. But now we don't want to assume that. And we want to ask if non-contextuality is true, what, uh, how far away from perfect is this going to be? How far away from 1 is this quantity going to be? Okay? So we know that it has to be less than 1, because otherwise we have a contradiction. Right? We just don't know what the number should be. Okay? So that number can be calculated. And that number turns out to be 5 by 6. And you have to do a bit of uh, 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 this um, numerics to like enumerate a, a convex polytope of which like, there are some extreme points. And one of the, uh, the extreme points that gives you the maximum value for this guy it gives you 5 by 6. And, and that point is basically, there's a bunch of points which give you 5 by 6. And so, so this is this is an assignment of probabilities to those measurement outcomes. Okay, those those zero one uh, sorry any any probability assigned to measurement outcomes. So here we're denoting probability one by a black node, uh, zero by a uh, white node, and uh, half by a gray node. Okay. So here we see that this is not a deterministic assignment. It's deterministic for these guys, but it's indeterministic for these three guys. This one, this one, and this one. For these three operational equivalence classes, it's the uh, it's indeterministic. So you're assigning probabilities half here. And this is an extremal vertex of the polydope, which has 146 vertices and is nine dimensional. So it's nine dimensional because we have those nine constraints and like, there are 18 variables, so there's nine free variables. And the, you want to ask the, what is the set of possible probabilities that, that are consistent with that. And it turns out that that's, that's basically, there's a bunch of extremal uh, solutions. That corres those correspond, correspond to vertices of this polytope. And when you mix the convex mixtures of those assignments, then you get other possible solutions. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the inequality. Uh, actually, the proof is also not that difficult. It's just like you've, I've just kind of expanded that uh, that quantity, that perfect correlation quantity, in terms of the ontological model. Then I have taken the max probability over all uh, the k's in a given measurement. So k one, two, three, four. I've taken the largest probability there. I call it zeta. I take that out. K can be pushed in. And then I have like this one fourth. I take one fourth inside, and this is the uh, the distribution for the average preparation. And uh, you know, then you eventually show that uh, they, this quantity is bounded by a convex mixture of these quantities, and then you say that the maximum over this quantity is the upper bound. Uh, Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so I, now we come to, uh, so so far, everything I've said is uh, using that one example. And 
what the problem we were trying to deal with was this problem of uh, noisy measurements, that, that measurements uh, can be uh, not perfectly predictable. So you have to, you, so, so if you look at this inequality, this says that A is less than or equal to 5 by 6. So there's a finite gap between 5 by 6 and 1. So what is this saying? This is saying that if you were able to realize the quantum projectors exactly, like you were able to prepare pure states, you were able to measure projective measurements, everything was exact, as the theory says, then you should achieve A equals 1. And that gives you your quotient specker contradiction. But quotient specker is silent when it comes to noise in those uh, uh, preparations and measurements. If you didn't prepare pure states, if you had mixed states, or you know, if you, uh, so, so, so this inequality is saying, as long as you preserve those operational equivalences, even if you had some noise, the, you can give a quantitative bound on this quantity. So you're saying you don't have to be perfectly predictable, even if you can be sort of more than 5 sixths predictable, then you have shown contextuality. You've shown that something non-trivial is going on, that there's like in an ontological model, you have to fine tune things somehow, right? Which is sort of, um, in, in some sense, not a, a natural thing. So, so, so this is sort of a, so we treat this as some sort of a signature of, 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 uh, uh, of, of a genuine uh, quantum behavior, okay. Um, okay, so 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 this gap between five by six and one allows you to contend with noise in your preparations and measurements, which is not possible in the quotient specker theorem. The second problem, another critical problem, when you actually try to do an experimental test, is that uh, these operational equivalences that we assumed, we were saying that you have to have exactly equal probabilities of measurement outcomes for two preparations, for all measurement outcomes for two preparation, preparation procedures, and then they are operationally equivalent. To define that and to operationally test that, I have to actually see that in a lab. But in a lab, typically, like, you know, there will be some deviations from what I want to do will not be eventually what I end up doing. There will be some deviations from what I intended to measure. So it, it, it will, in general, happen that there will be these equivalences will not be exactly satisfied. There will be some small difference between the thing, the preparation procedure on the left-hand side and the preparation procedure on the right-hand right side, or for the measurement events, okay? So now this is a fundamental problem because if you don't even have operational equivalences, then there's no reason to assume non-contextuality because the whole purpose of non-contextuality was to explain these operational equivalences in a natural manner. But if they don't exist in the first place, then it doesn't make sense to talk about a, an experimental test of contextuality, okay? And a, and a lot of previous work has ignored this problem, that, that they haven't uh, taken into account the fact that you know, it, it doesn't make sense to apply non-contextuality to, to inequivalent uh, procedures, however s uh, small the difference between them may be, okay? So, so how do we handle this problem? So a proposal for handling this problem was developed and implemented in, in an experimental test of what I call the fair coin flip non-contextuality inequality in this paper, uh, where, um, so this proposal is largely due to Matt Busey, and my contribution was mostly in the first problem which is why this is at the end of the talk. Uh, so, so the way we handle this problem is by demanding a little more structure of the operational theory. So far, all we have demanded of the operational theory is that there exists some operational equivalences and like, you know, you can verify them and, and that kind of thing. But note that to even to verify an operational equivalence, it, it, it's potentially possible that an operational theory may have an infinite number of measurements possible. And if I say it's, it's these two operational procedures are equivalent for all possible measurement procedures, then I have to do an infinite number of experiments to verify that. So we are, we are forced to demand more structure. We are forced to demand some sort of a notion of, of a, a canonical set, a, a fiducial set of measurements that, that you can do, from which you can derive the statistics for all the other measurements. So this is what in quantum information is called the notion of tomographic completeness. So for a qubit, for example, if you have statistics for sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, you can reconstruct the state and you can get statistics for any other measurement. Okay, so those, that's a tomographically complete set of measurements for uh, a qubit in quantum theory. So here we are asking of, a, of an operational theory that there's a finite set of measurements, which if I do, I'm insured of operational equivalence. So I have to assume this, otherwise I can't verify operational equivalence in an experiment. Uh, so so, that's, a, that's, that's, another, so, so that's in some sense uh, a sort of a, uh, an additional thing we have introduced, which is sort of like how are you gonna test for such a thing, right? Like that there is, exists no measurement which will not give you a, uh, an answer which is different from what you might get from the ones you've done. So um, anyway, so we assume this, and assuming that, the way we handle this problem, okay, anyway, so the, f let me first state the inequality. The inequality is actually very similar to the one that I just talked about. Here you have six preparation procedures, six measurement events, and you're looking for uh, this predictability type of quantity here as well. 
Uh, but the operational equivalences you're using are fewer. You're just using two operational equivalences. One is that uh, equal mixtures of T0 and T1. So, so that'll be called PT. So P1 is an equal mixture of P10 and P11. P2 is equal mixture of P20 and 21. 3 is an equal mixture of 30 and 31. Okay, these three are operationally equivalent. And you require that uh, measurement, which is called M star, which is built out of these three measurements, uh, M1, M2, M3, which are two outcome measurements, uh, is a fair coin flip. So I'm saying that this, this, this is how I'm constructing this, these guys. This is how I'm constructing this guy. And I demand that this is just a fair coin flip. Okay? So this should remind you of the example I gave you of, of, of the projectors, which uh, you know, are operationally equivalent to a fair coin flip measurement. Uh, okay, it's too far back. Yeah, this one. Okay, so in, in a quantum experiment, you can realize them using these projectors, the, the, those measurements. And in fact, the P10 there is like pi1 here, and P11 is pi1 perpendicular. P20 is this, P21 is this, P30 is this, P31 is this. And then you know that like, you know, uh, the, the quantity that you have there, so basically you, you have a value one for that quantity because you're measuring every projector in its uh, eigenstate. But that's in a pure case, like, you know, like you, you're not lying for no, noise there. So our inequality is able to handle noise, as I said. And uh, the way we handle operational equivalence is this, inequivalence is this, that the ideal set of preparations we wanted to do, so those, those three projectors I showed you were basically these guys in quantum theory. Uh, the trine measurements, they're separated by 120 degrees on the ZX plane, okay? And this, this, is just, this is just orthogonal to this. And these three mix to uh, the same uh, density operator, which is the maximally mixed state in quantum theory. Okay, so I'm just using the block sphere picture because it's more familiar to sort of um, explain this approach. But the approach is independent of quantum theory because we use uh, this framework called general, general probabilistic theories to, to do this, which assumes less than quantum theory. Okay, so. Um, so it turns out that the primary procedures you do in the lab, this is what you do in an experiment, there's deviations from what you actually wanted to do, okay? So these squares are what you ended up doing, but you wanted to do this ideal thing, okay? And it so happens that these things no longer meet, these three lines don't meet. So that operational equivalence is lost. Like these mixtures are not operationally equivalent anymore, okay? So that thing is lost. Now what do you do in, in the face of this? So this is where you assume this convexity property. Which is that if I if I if I have done experimentally these three these six preparations, then using the statistics of these, I can infer statistics of anything in the convex hull of these six guys. Okay, so all these infinite number of preparations in their convex hull are can their prop their probabilities can be inferred from the statistics of these six. Okay, so then so here we have used that convex structure, and then we look for in this space we look for six preparations such that that preparation is as close as possible to what we actually did in the lab. At the same time, we are able to satisfy an operational equivalence, okay? Note that this operational equivalence is no longer the same as identity over two. So that fact is irrelevant to our inequality, actually, because we just need operational equivalence. We are not demanding anything about the theory or the mixed state that is prepared, okay? We just require that the mixed state is operationally equivalent, okay? So we have restored the operational equivalence by using this fact. So there's an optimization you have to do. The trade-off is between uh, how much, how far away from this do you go? And, and uh, like you want to go as far as, you want to move as little as possible and, and, ment and ensure that uh, this operational equivalence is maintained in order to be able to violate the inequality. So if the measurement is too noisy, you will not violate the inequality. Similarly, for the measurement operators, you do a similar trick. This is just the block cone sort of picture for uh, measurements in sigma x and sigma z kind of measurements. And it's the same sort of narrative here. Anyway, so our results. Uh, so uh, results are in basically, like we can divide them into two broad classes. One is this robust non-contextuality inequalities. Uh, what I just talked about is the first row here. We used one preparation uh, equivalence, 18 equivalences between me measurement procedures. And we got this inequality. This was published in this paper. It's in chapter six of the thesis. The second inequality is for these preparations and measurements. Uh, it's we're using one preparation equivalence, one measurement equivalence, and this is the inequality we get. This is published in this paper. It's in chapter six of the thesis. And there's a more complicated set of inequalities for other scenarios where we use this, these operational uh, equivalences and we get some non-contextuality inequalities. But the idea is the same. 
These were simple to present, so I presented them. These are more sort of uh, complicated to present. This is in chapter seven of the thesis. It's unpublished so far. Uh, related results. Um, so uh, my first result, first paper was actually with Sibashish. Well, first paper was with Simon, but uh, with, with Sibashish was the one that's uh, in my thesis. And <laughs> uh, so, well, first published paper, I think. First one on the archive was with Sibashish still. Anyway, so, but there was a mistake in it, which we fixed later, so. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so th this, this paper was about something called Specker scenario, where we, um, uh, showed that, uh, that, it, that it's possible to so, show contextuality for uh, measurements on POVMs on a qubit using non-projective measurements. So this was conjectured not to be the case. We showed that this is the case. This is in chapter two and three of the thesis in this reference. Uh, another result which I really like is one where we showed that uh, quantum theory allows arbitrary joint measurability relations between uh, measure, uh, measurements. Okay, so general by PO, measurements I mean POVMs. Okay. In projective measurements, uh, the set of, so by joint measurability relations, I mean which observables are jointly measurable with which observables. So if you draw a graph, and like nodes of the graph are observables, and edges are joint measurability relations. Uh, an edge between two nodes says that those observables are jointly measurable. Then all graphs admit a, a representation in terms of projective measurements, okay? And the converse is also true. The relations between projective measurements can be represented by graphs. But if you're considering a more general notion of a graph, which is a hypergraph, which is what I showed you, for example, that, that 18 ray thing was, is what is technically called a hypergraph, where you have like, you know, the, the most general hypergraphs are also realizable with POVMs, is what we showed in this paper. It's in chapter four of the thesis and in this paper. Uh, third paper is this one, which is on, uh, in PRA. It's, it, it shows that Fine's theorem does not absolve one of the need to justify outcome determinism in non-contextual ontological models of quantum theory. That's a mouthful, but it, all it says is that uh, for Bell's theorem, this issue of outcome determinism is essentially a non-issue. Why? Because of Fine's theorem. Fine's theorem sh says that if you can build a deterministic model in a Bell scenario, like a deterministic local invariable model, then you can build a corresponding indeterministic model, which will reproduce the same predictions that you get from the deterministic model. So uh, determinism, indeterminism doesn't matter in Bell's theorem. And, and a lot of people often say that, oh, because of Fine's theorem, we don't need to worry about it in uh, quotient specker uh, scenarios as well, like in, in non-contextuality experiments as well. Uh, so this paper differs with that. Uh, conclusion and shows why that's not the case, that it doesn't absolve you of uh, having to justify outcome determinants. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's it's the same same scenario. Yeah, yeah. So if we take this quotient figure, the original graph, the non commutative, non commutative, everything here. So what is your intuition? This bound will it be close to one or far from one? Uh, so the thing is that the 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 way this result was derived, I told you was by by enumerating the vertices of this polytope, the set of solutions, right? So. I had no sort of physical intuition for why it was five by six or something. The physical intuition was only that it should be less than one, whatever it is. Okay, and when you do the numerics, you get the exact number. Uh, my, my question is, mm. if, we, uh, if we increase the number of vectors, so I, uh, I don't know if I can make a statement about that. I have some partial results. Which uh, so I've been I've been trying to sort of give like a fairly analytical argument for this this thing which which we've done numerically here, uh, and I'm hoping that that will generalize. So um, I think I can't remember the expression now, but like but I think I think it, I think it it probably uh, went uh, okay I don't remember now like but, yeah. Uh, no, I didn't do it for example specific. So the, the, the way it's derived is for a, you give me an uncolorable hypergraph and I'll say that uh, the bound that you will get if you are satisfying uh, you, those operational equivalences for a, for a set of uh, measurements, then that will be, I'll give you an upper bound. It may not be saturated, like. Yeah, so you got, my, my question is, if it becomes 
what is your intuition like what So you're saying that will be the true if if this goes to one. Yes. Okay, I don't know if that will be true, but like because I'm not very well versed with the Kolbeck Renner paper. Uh, but yeah, we can discuss this because yeah, yeah. Yeah. So preparation and measurement. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So you are assigning probability. Yeah. Uh, and that probability is, you are demonstrating that probabilities are non conscious. Yeah. Quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just as they are in quantum mechanics, yeah. So you are invoking this information, universal non conscious, right? Then I come to, if I come to the business program, yeah. to which uh, probabilities are non conscious. Hmm. If you extend quantum theory, it would govern this definition. Ah. So that's, is, that's if you're assuming the Hilbert space sort of picture, right? Like Gleason's theorem says that, like, the the way the unique way to assign probabilities to projectors is via the bond rule right in in three dimensions and higher but anyway yeah so you are taking a like you need to assume like that your outcomes are represented by projectors and you want to assign probabilities to these projectors and then you show that that the unique way to assign probabilities to these guys is via uh, a, a bond rule assignment that's that's the yeah yeah, yeah. So, so what is the question here Relevant. So, what are the new things you are telling? Uh, new things in the sense. So, so ah, okay. So, so let me let me just mention that bond bond rule assignments are not the only measurement non-contextual assignments possible, right? Because the set of measurement non-contextual assignments is larger than the set of just bond rule assignments. But Gleason's theorem says it is not. No, no. Gleason's theorem tells you it's it is not for quantum theory because you're assuming some structure there. If you if I'm just saying. That if I'm looking at this thing, uh, if I'm if I'm just trying to assign probabilities to these 18 guys, such that this is satisfied, then the set of solutions is larger than what you would get if these probabilities were obtained by taking trace of some state rho with respect to these projectors or with any set of projectors, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming.